Today is Friday, January 21st, 2021, which means it's Derelict Friday. Hello, fiendlings! How the hell are you? I seem to be crawling out from under the gauze of COPD, although I still have some special moments throughout the day. Sleep is one of those luxuries I chase, but I catch it more often than not now. At least I can make it through the night without a coughing fit. Just in case you didn't know, getting older sucks. On the writing front, Shipyards is closer to being finished, one terrible word at a time. I feel as though I'm a day away from finishing the rough draft, yet distractions and, yes, health make it just a tad frustrating. Sounds a lot like life, doesn't it? I wish I had something more to say, but I'm not really awake. My brain feels like mush, and therefore it's time to have more coffee and get some writing done before I start today's coding. Be safe, have a great week, and we'll talk again real soon. Here's episode 8 of Derelict Trident. Carr breached the short slip point leading to the lower deck and crouched. Nano probe, boss. Why not? I'm not exactly worried about quartermaster complaints. Kelly watched Carb pull the device from her pouch and set it up. She knew what Carb was worried about. With power, the slip point constrained movement while its passengers transitioned from one level to another, thus keeping a human being from clipping their head on the cylinder or maneuvering out of the field before they reached the deck. In ZG, however, there were no such mechanisms in place. On Mira, the massive slip points had been made to ferry crew from one end of the kilometer-long ship to the other, and all points in between. SNR models, however, weren't designed for more than one passenger at a time. SFMC had thoughtfully made them more than large enough for a suited human to get in and out of, although there wasn't too much room for error. That meant you couldn't jet toward them in ZG. When you were in the short tube in ZG, it was nearly impossible to perform any kind of ambush on your targets. Boon and bane, Kelly thought. If you were boarded and attempting to repel, it was a boon. The enemy would have to crawl through the spaces one at a time between the decks, unless they blew the emergency hatches. And even then, they'd be lucky to fit three at a time and risk being destroyed by fire from the most easily defended positions on this ship. If you were attacking, well, you better be cautious or risk being wiped out. The creatures didn't have rocket-propelled munitions nor magneto-launched flechette rounds, but what they did have were deadly melee attacks that could strike from a meter away and acid projectiles that ate through SFMC combat suits. To make matters worse, the damn things were impossible to see unless they were highly radioactive or happened to find your lights. Sending in a nanoprobe would at least give them some idea of whether or not the ingress was clear. Kelly imagined poking her head through that hole and immediately being grabbed by something from the yawning darkness while their screams of surprise and terror blew out her eardrums. Yeah, nanoprobe. A new feed appeared on her HUD and Kelly maximized it. The light from the probe easily illuminated the short tube and found the lower deck. Kelly overlaid the SNR model schematics, and her block adjusted to follow the probe's feed. The view transformed into a textured approximation of what the area would look like beneath normal lights. The probe's camera rotated 360 degrees, the light easily dispelling the darkness for a few meters. The acid in her stomach quieted. A little. The corridor leading to the infirmary and stasis pods appeared clear, but she could see swirls of debris in that direction. Chips of ice, some as fine as powder, glitter beneath the lights, making the image seem to wave and ripple. Water, Dickerson said. Pops must have ruptured. Or coolant, Kelly said and gestured aft. Reserve tanks are back there, spanning nearly two decks. Shit, Carb said. I guess we should have expected that. Doesn't matter, Kelly said. She replayed the feed and mapped the location of the rip in the hull. A thin smile crossed her lips. No, I think the rip in the hull is what punctured the lines. The rip is in the stasis area. Well, Dickerson said. Yes, that. A flashing alert struck her HUD. Claymore detonated. Kelly quickly plotted the location on the schematics. Engineering, she said. Figures, Carb said. They were probably fucking to create that radiation. Move, Kelly said as calmly as she could. We'll go out the emergency airlock at the other end of the corridor. Carb grabbed the edges of the slip point and pistoned her arms, 
letting go at the end of the motion. She disappeared through the hole and was quickly down on the lower deck. Callie was next, using the same exercise. Her magnetics caught the deck, and she absorbed the shock by bending her knees, the suit's armor cushioning the force. She quickly pushed herself to the bulkhead, leaving Dickerson a clear path. He was through a second later. The moment Dickerson recovered from the drop, Kelly pushed off the bulkhead back to the deck. Carb, you're on point. Copy, Carb said, but she was already mag walking down the corridor in a combat crouch. Kelly added the feeds from her squad's cameras to her HUD. Dickerson had turned to face the opposite end of the corridor, his rifle pointed at the slip point. Dickerson, make sure... Her voice cut off as a radiation warning flashed across her HUD. Shit, Carb, get ready to... What the fuck is that? Carb shrieked into the mic. Kelly flipped to Carb's feed, but she needn't have bothered. Her own forward cam feed showed her enough. The entrance to the lockers flickered with an eerie light, malevolent shadows appearing on the bulkheads. Squad, Kelly yelled. Head for the rip! She turned off her magnetics and kicked off the deck, her left boot re-engaging before she could bounce off the outmost steel. Kelly kicked again, timing her jumps and landings in conjunction with her magnetics. With Dickerson mag walking as fast as he could, she easily outpaced him and reached the entrance to the infirmary. On my six! Carb yelled. Kelly spun herself in a tight circle and caught the bulkhead with one glove, rifle aiming down the corridor. Dickerson crouched, giving Kelly a clear sight line. A shadow that was not a shadow departed the locker room entrance, its surface shimmering beneath their lights, its inner core glowing with a rainbow of colors. Kelly's rad meter spiked with sources both above and in front of her. The creatures were closing in. She squeezed the trigger with careful, calm focus. Three tritium flechettes streaked down the corridor, the first striking a starfish tentacle, exploding in a shower of atmosteel steel shards and heavy water. The appendage disappeared in a cloud of black crumbs that vibrated in the light. The second impacted the creature dead center, the glow at its core flashing into bright light as the munition detonated. The carapace split into dozens of pieces, rotating and bouncing off the bulkheads. The third round smashed into the far bulkheads just as another shape entered the corridor. The tritium flechettes shattered against the bulkheads, the heavy water transforming into blobs of colorless, glittering diamonds beneath her lights. The creature leaving the lockers flew into the cloud of debris, water, and metal shards, its carapace seeming to melt where the water touched it. The shimmering shells sprouted thousands of cracks before shattering. Go! Kelly screamed. Dickerson disappeared into the stasis room, Carb quickly following. Kelly fired one more flechette without aiming and immediately pushed herself into the stasis room. The moment she made it through, Dickerson closed the hatch behind her. That ain't going to hold for long, Dickerson said. Without any sound in the vacuum, it was impossible to know if the creatures were banging at the door, although the ice crystals breaking off the metal was a pretty good indication. The rad meter, briefly muted by shutting the hatch, began rising again. I think you're right, Kelly said. We need to... What the void is that? Carb said over the comms. Kelly turned from the hatch and found Carb standing over the stasis pods. She opened her mouth to speak and quickly shut it. One of the stasis pods had been forced open, the trans aluminum shielding cracked and broken, shards of its remains floating near the ceiling. Kelly walked forward until she could see inside the pod. Frozen blood clung to the stasis bed in streaks and whirls. It wasn't enough to account for an entire human being, even if you included the crimson ice chips floating in the room. Large dents and divots in the remaining metal casing told the story better than the leavings of whatever human had been inside. Someone tried to hide, Kelly said, or maybe enter stasis until it all ended. NRX of solar friends found them, Dickerson said. Kelly's rad meter jumped another notch. Carb, check the other pods. Make sure they're empty. Copy, she said. Dickerson? I Corporal. Kelly turned, her rifle reflexively aiming at the hatch. Check the hull rip, she said. We're going out that way. Copy, Dickerson said. The large marine moved out of her field of vision, leaving her alone, facing the enemy beyond the ten centimeters of atmost steel. Her rad meter rose another notch, 
Still not in the red, but there wasn't much yellow left. Carb, tell me something. Finished, Carb said. None of the other pots are damaged. No one home. Copy. Dickerson. We can get through there, Dickerson said. It'll be tight, but one at a time we should be okay. Copy. The rad meter rose another notch and was now nearly in the red, but the hatch was no longer buckling under the pressure from unseen appendages. The rad meter entered the red. She activated an infrared filter and looked around the room. High in the bulkhead, a vent cover vibrated. Oh shit! Squad, get through the rip now! Dickerson motioned the carb and pointed toward the gash in the Atmos steel bulkhead. The smaller marine demagged herself from the deck and leaped at the giant rip. As Kali magwalked as fast as she could, Carb disappeared through the tear in the hull. Dickerson! Kelly yelled. Egress! That's a... Too fucking late! He yelled back at her. Three rounds left his barrel, the rocket engines kicking into life just before they streaked over Kelly's head. She cut her magnetics and poised to leap. Her left boot struck the corner of a stasis pod, the collision pulling her slightly to the left of her target. She was going to hit the bulkhead and impale herself on the rip's jagged teeth. Chapter 12 The moment he'd seen the corporal staring at the vent, the rad readings and the vid recording of what had happened on the bridge fit themselves together with a flash of insight. He knew exactly what was going to happen and what the corporal had seen. By the time she ordered him out, he was already firing. The first round reached the vent just as the filtering grate shot out into the room. It detonated, sending droplets of heavy water and shards of Atmos steel bouncing around the enclosed space. The second hit the swarm of creatures leaving their makeshift ingress. They kept coming, and he kept firing. A few heartbeats later and he caught sight of Callie Moore flying to the rip. She yelled over the comms and he realized she was going to clip the side of the metal. On instinct, he freed one hand from the rifle and increased the glove magnetics to full. His fingers were going to miss hers by millimeters, but the glove was enough to pull her toward him. She folded her body into the fetal position and made her way through the rip. Dickerson looked up. The swarm coming through had grown into a storm of absolute darkness, swallowing his light as though it were not there at all. Again, he pulled the trigger. Kelly Mora was yelling at him over the comms to get his fat ass out of there, but he continued firing until his magazine ran dry. Bouchettes bounced off bulkheads, off stasis pod shielding, and off the ceiling and deck. He still had the trigger pulled for several beats after the weapon stopped firing. Crumbs of carapace, chips of Atmos steel, and other debris swirled through the room. The cloud of creatures had dispersed into smaller groups while the flechettes zoomed toward them, but no longer. They were reforming into a wall of claws, maws, and appendages. Kelly Moore bellowed over the comms. Move! What a good idea, he thought. Dickerson quickly turned and used his mag glove to pull himself toward the rip. He saw motion on the cam feeds through his peripheral vision, but didn't have to look at them to know the creatures had decided to mount and attack. They were coming for him. Heart thrashing, ears pounding with a manic beat, Dickerson grabbed the edge of the tear and pulled himself through. As he emerged through the hull into the glare of SNR Black's powerful floods, his HUD streamed with alerts. He'd perforated one of his gloves while escaping through the hull. Something reached for him and Dickerson scrambled to pull up his rifle. The universe cartwheeled before him as his view shifted from the hull of SNR Black to the Kuiper Belt and beyond. The dizzying view ended as he swung into Red's hull. He's clear, Kalimura yelled. Dickerson glanced to the side and peered into Kalimura's visor. Her hand had pulled him from the rip and swung him into the hull a few meters away. Something black flew through the rip and a shock flechette plowed into it, sending blue arcs of electricity licking off its carapace. The small creature exploded into a stream of fragments flowing into the everlasting night. Another round detonated at the rip, followed by four more. Wint and Murdoch were firing round after round into the damaged hull plate. Hold your fire, Kelly yelled. The fuselage stopped immediately. For a long moment, Dickerson waited for more yelling and excited chatter over the comms, expecting another push by the creatures. When it didn't happen, he finally relaxed. A little. You okay? 
she asked him over a private channel. Dickerson struggled out of her grasp and maglocked himself to the hull. Nicked a glove on the metal, ripped through the surface, but the holes closed. He bent his head to one side and groaned with pleasure when a crack resounded through his suit. I need a massage. Nothing a few hits off a vape won't cure either, he panted. Fucking shoulder hurts again. Corporal. Wentz's voice filled the squad channel. Nothing else moving. Copy, she said. You stay right where you are and provide cover. We're going to jet away using our suits. Dickerson may need some help. Aye, Wentz said. Murdoch, get your ass on top of the bow and keep your head on a swivel. Aye, the young Marine said. Damn, Dickerson said. Might be turning that boy into a soldier yet. Carr giggled. Dickerson, you're on the squad channel. Fuck, he said and muted himself. And that's why you're a Lance Corporal, Carb said. Well, one of the reasons. Shut up, Carb, Dickerson said. Kelly Mora went silent for a moment. Dickerson imagined she was talking to Talby over the command channel. He hoped for her sake she didn't forget to use it again in the future. She might be the company's NCO for the time being, but that wouldn't prevent her from one of Talby's epic rage-induced rants. Sometimes the LT made Gunny look like a wet nurse. Squad! Kelly yelled. Bogey's incoming. Carp, Dickerson, jet now. We're out of here. Back to black ASAP. He didn't ask questions, and neither did Carp. The three of them pushed off the hull nearly simultaneously, their rear jets firing as soon as they faced SNR Black. They would make it back to black, but they were defenseless, and it would take more time than he liked. Where the void is the LT? 